let's do a little telephone video. People who are familiar with British Stroger equipment will recognize this, which is a, a test tool that can be used to poke a point inside the system when it's on and check whether that point is at a ground potential, battery potential, or open. So that came with my system, sort of. It needed 48 volt, volt bulbs, uh, wedge based bulbs, 48 volt. I don't have any, I have six volt. So that didn't work. So I ended up to figure stuff out. I made this ridiculous contraption, which is a similar idea, but it integrates a level of my own stupidity into its design. At the time I didn't have a vat of 310 connectors. So I just poked the wires into the appropriate places. I had two LEDs and a switch. Why does it have that? Well, let me show you. Now, I did say a vat of 310 connectors and others. There are, of course, two different... That's a 310. That's the other one, which is what the battery jack is actually meant to take, but it doesn't really matter. I like this style better because it doesn't stress the uh, springs as much because that little ball on the end is all that engages. Anyway, I needed that. All right, I'm all set up here. So here's how my terrible design works. Put it to positive, I get an LED. This is based on a micro switch. If I click the micro switch, it switches the LED that's in line with that resistor sticking out the end there. So that's checking for positive voltage, that's checking for negative. And it's a bit sketchy because, so now if I switch to this one, I push the switch, it checks for negative when the switch is down, which is battery, and this is checking for ground. So that's ground, check for battery, check for ground, check for battery. So to do any testing, I had to sit there and click the button. And I did that because I, I'm not, my brain doesn't work. So I got the official version plugged in and now you'll see why I'm showing you this. Ooh, it has LEDs now. I own this thing, but I didn't, I didn't bother to think about how it worked, which is why I was stupid. I actually discovered how it worked when I was working out the design for this, which is terribly not complicated. But I thought, well, that's silly. Why would they do it that way? Well, because this way it works. Look, am I, I'm on the positive terminal, positive. And now I can move to negative. Now I'm on negative, negative, positive, negative. And if you watch closely, you probably can't even tell on the camera why it works. And the reason it works, simple. And most of you have figured it out by now, but I'll draw a little schematic. So here's what's inside. There's an LED, 4.7K resistor. Another 4.7K resistor, another LED, and it goes to the negative. So that's be the positive and negative, and then the probe is connected between those two. So when the probe isn't connected to anything, both the LEDs light up because they're it's just a straight path from plus to positive to negative. They're running at half the voltage or half the current because there's effectively two current limiting resistors in series, which is why they're a tiny bit dimmer when they're both on. So when the probe is connected to positive, it shorts out this part of the circuit, this LED remains on. And it goes a little bit brighter because it gets full current through its current limiting resistor. When the probe's connected to negative, it shorts out this portion of the circuit and that one remains on, this one turns off. So it's really simple. And then in, inside that probe, this is what was originally wired, which I don't know why I didn't clue in or even think of examining it closer. Two 48 volt bulbs in series and the probe between them. The probe just all short out one of those two bulbs. I converted this to LEDs because now it's it's quite low impedance, whereas before it was driving lamps, which could alter the readings. It's not super low impedance. I probably could have made my resistors double the value. These are uh, quite high efficient LEDs, high efficiency LEDs. It works nice enough. I'm happy with it. So inside here, there was originally, this is the cord coming in. There was a block of phenolic material with a bunch of contacts on top. Like that, the spacers and stuff for the wedge-based lamps. They were all on top of here and that stuff kind of ended here. And then there's another block of phenolic that the lamp would get inserted into. And it would kind of keep the lamp aligned from touching the case. And that's just a floating block. And then it was wired as I show in the schematic. So to make my change, I picked up some of these super cheap LED thingy majiggers. There's a little plastic bit that shoves in the end. And that's what those are. But this piece of phenolic, it actually was a, a, a slip fit for these. So they just they just went in smoothly. There was no friction. So I couldn't tap it. And they're metric threads. And I don't have, I have like two metric taps. 
So what I did is I drilled a little hole in the side of each bore and ran a little tiny set screw in. These are held in with little set screws coming down through that block from inside. That block's floating, so I actually had to cut a piece of aluminum that's on top of here. <laughs> that's, uh, there's two of these screws come in through the bottom here. There's a screw and it goes through the top to a little plate. And then there's a screw inside that's actually a countersunk screw that goes up through that plate as well. So I just added this, this piece of aluminum here, which is just a rectangle with four holes drilled in it to keep this block from sliding out. Otherwise, you could just push on the LEDs and the whole thing would slide inside the case. And then there's just you know, the LEDs are in there with some leads soldered on, soldered, yes, I said it, Noel. And I have British parents. That's how they taught me. They taught me to say it without an L. There's the two resistors are just hanging off of this thing and it's all heat shrinked and dead bugged together. I just noticed now though, I just noticed. I forgot the grommet that's supposed to go in there. Wah, wah. So I'm keeping all the parts from the original thing because I like to just keep it. So I, I barely modified, the only modification I made were the two tiny holes in that with the set screws, which don't affect the original operation in any way. If I ever felt like switching it back to 48 volt. This is the reason I didn't feel bad about modifying a piece of vintage gear. This was the original wire that came with it. You can't hear it anymore. I had too much fun with it. But it had gone hard. It had gone rock hard. I would bend it, it would go crunch, 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 crunch. The, the, underneath this fabric, there's rubber insulation that, that it turned into a rock. So it, it went crunch, crunch, crunch. So it's done. It goes in the garbage. And I have a million of these patch cables, so I just cut the end off of one. And reuse the spade terminals. Pro tip, the easiest way to get them off the wire is to burn them. I just used a lighter and heated them up till the rubber turned to ashes, yanked them out, and uh, straightened the uh, spade back out, cleaned it up with a wire brush, worked beautiful. There you, you can see. Whoa! Uh, don't be dumb like me. I, uh, you can see there, I shorted the two sides together, discharged the caps and the power supply. There we go, look at my hands, aren't they beautiful? This is a discussion I got into somewhere online, which is about maintaining vintage tools. I I try my best, or maintaining vintage objects, I try my best to uh, keep everything original, but sometimes it's not possible. The parts aren't available. It's too costly to maintain something in a vintage manner, or it's not safe. The way they were doing it wasn't safe. And for something that's being used in a modern place, you want it to be safe. If you have the option to make things safer, you want to do that. So, I mean, this isn't a matter of safety. This is a matter of convenience. It, it's a tool. I need a to, the tool to work and I need it to work well. And so to me, I have no problem with modifying this to make it work better. The way I see it is if, if it's something that helps preserve an object, then it's a good thing. So this comes up, this actually came up discussing linotypes. These have a common problem with the heating controls. They, they, don't, they don't age well. They have mercury thermostats and eventually they leak the mercury into the pot and they stop working and they're just they're they're not they don't work well so a lot of people upgrade them to this kind of thing here one of those not the whole thing but that these little pid temperature controllers you pop two of those in one for the mouthpiece one for the pot and it works well and i think that's a good idea because it keeps the linotype working and a working machine has a better chance of surviving than a dead machine because when I die and someone has to deal with all my crap, some other collector coming to look at my junk might be more willing to take the machine if it's functioning than if it's broken and it needs more work. So I, I, the way I see it is working junk is better. Working junk with some modern modifications is better than vintage junk with no modifications. And then the other point I like to make is that if this stuff had stayed in service through some weird space time malfunction if people were still using line there are people still using them people would maintain it they would they would upgrade and maintain them using modern technology they wouldn't they wouldn't be sticklers about using everything vintage because i'm, I'm more of a this is more of a hobby I, I make some effort to try to keep things vintage which is why when i add wiring to this i try to you know use proper lacing cord and make things look nice point is no one is the grand arbiter of what is vintage and what is not because <gasps> look at that almost Almost touched the lie of just laying there. I can actually close that now. Yeah, that's all I have to say about that.